was a Leicester GP. I came to Leicester back in 1982, having qualified in, uh, in Yorkshire, in Sheffield. Did my undergraduate training and then postgraduate training in Leeds. Anyway, to cut a long story short, um, I've become very attached to this county. So I was a, a GP from 1982 until, uh, well, in fact, up until uh, three years ago. So uh, in that time, I also serve, uh, served as a police surgeon. Uh, so apart from being a, a GP looking after the community health, uh, I was rather intrigued by things that were changing in the political scene. Because as you know, um, being, in, being a GP in Asmonso, a poor district, in fact, one of the 10 poorest wards in the country, you notice when people are not properly looked after um, by their policies. So whilst I may do my work and work as hard as I can to look after patients, there were difficulties in terms of uh, accessing health, uh, there were long waiting lists and so on. So when COVID came along, um, already the health service was declining, but COVID actually degraded um, services for the community. Certainly overnight, you couldn't see your GP. Um, it was all by remote consultation, either emails or um, phone calls. You were lucky if you got a phone call to speak with your GP. Um, and then there were situations where, um, you know, to go up to the GP or go and visit somebody in the hospital or see your friends or relatives, you had to mask up, you had to socially distance. And then came the proper lockdown. So being a GP, I noticed when the pandemic was declared back in 2020, um, you had no, no say in the matter. And we all took it for granted that we had to do certain things. And then came the um, COVID vaccination. Now, if you remember, it was a phase three clinical product, in phase three clinical trial. Uh, clinical trials are divided into phase one, phase two, and phase three. Phase one is basically just experiments, phase two in paid volunteers, uh, phase three in patients, but you have low numbers, low numbers, where you closely monitor uh, the patients taking part in the phase three study. Now, it is a trial, it is not by coercion, but they managed to roll it out, not just in this country, but across the world, with no safety data, with no informed consent. Now, informed consent is basically a discussion between the doctor and the patient, uh, describing the, the procedure that's involved or the medication that's involved, what it entails, the benefits, the disadvantages, and the risks. Now, none of the risks were really described to the, to the um, patients being vaccinated. My own wife, under pressure, went for the vaccine. And all she said was, you might expect a bit of a soreness where you're injected. But for three weeks, she was very poorly. She was dizzy. She was vomiting a few times. But luckily, she recovered. Now, what the long-term consequences are, we don't know. What the COVID vaccines lack singularly is long-term studies. Now, when I was doing clinical trials as a junior registrar, senior registrar, you know, between the level, um, I had to give informed consent. I had to explain to the patient, these are the things you would expect. These are the benefits we hope you get. And if there's any untoward effect, we'll take you out of the trial uh, and we treat you accordingly. But you make these risks known to people. And you also offer the alternatives. So if you didn't take part in this trial uh, and you might be heading towards the thing we're trying to prevent, how can we rescue you? How can we stop you? How can we recover you from the problems? So. Those are the three things. The fourth thing is obviously mo long-term monitoring. And none of you, I believe, has been monitored. In fact, whenever you've been given the VAC, they say, just go away, and if any problems, talk to so-and-so. But you never can talk to anyone, because we know the health service has been very badly degraded. So that's COVID. Now, you might think that applies to you, but you know, the constraint the, the threat to bodily autonomy, the threat to people's livelihoods was so great. On the 11th of November, 2021, Sajid Javid said, look, you have a 16 week grace. If you want to continue in healthcare, you must have both the primary jab and the booster dose. And I remember coming across to uh, dog and gun across the road, uh, speaking to worried nurses, doctors, dentists, physiotherapists, 
the pub was crowded up. I'm sure Bill would tell you that that night was horrendous. And there were people so anxious because they were afraid, having heard and seen some of them, the bad effects of the vaccine, they wanted out of the program. They wanted to keep the jobs, but they didn't want the vaccine. And there was seemingly no choice. None of the, uh, the doctors were um, cooperative to give them the exemption certificates. I was willing to do that for them, as long as I knew the medical history. So we were fast forwarded into an era where the government was introducing draconian regulations to force uh, a sector of the working people to take the jabs, much against their, their wishes. But the last moment, the government backed down, obviously. But think about it, if you remember, Sajid Javid boasted that he had two jabs, and then he went on to get COVID. Whatever this COVID um, virus is, it's in the same category as influenza, and children suffer very little effects, and no child has been known, no healthy child has been known to die from coronavirus of other sorts. So why should we take the risk with our children and jab them with something which has no long-term safety data? And I can tell you this, the first time I saw a child, a 15-year-old child with myocarditis when I was working in Nottingham QMC casualty, it was horrendous. This was a healthy 15-year-old boy at football training. The mother brought him to casualty because he was having chest pain, shortness of breath. Now, I was just approaching my shift the advanced nurse practitioner had done all the tests, oxygen saturation, ECG, blood pressure, everything, all the monitorings were okay. But I said, Tech, since you're here, do you mind just looking at this boy who I was going to discharge as a case of musculoskeletal pain and then only to come back if there was difficulty? I said, well, if you're concerned, why don't we do troponin, D-dimer, a few basic things really, but the troponin was actually a marker for cardiac damage. And we sat the, uh, the child and the mother outside for about an hour. Results came back. The troponin was 10 times above normal. And the nurse said, shall we bring the registrar downstairs to examine the child? I said, you do nothing of the sort. You've done the examination. We got a troponin result. You better send him across to the Trent Cardiac Center at City Hospital. That's a case of myocarditis. It was the first time I encountered myocarditis in a young, healthy child. And that was two weeks after vaccination. We're doing this to our children. We're doing this to our people. No, we're not doing this to our people. Why are the doctors so complicit in the silence? Well, not all doctors are complicit. I've made my noise. I've been cautioned by NHS England. I've been reported to GMC. Both cases dropped. Now they want to retire. They say, well, we're, we're looking through your records to see if there's any uh, any uh, perpetration of breaking the GMC code or whatever it is. So they're trying to find problems for me. Well, the doctors have spoke up, like Dr. Sam White, I spoke with him on the phone, Dr. David Cartland in Cornwall. They'll all be, they're, they've all been censured. Um, there was a gentleman who's supposed to come and speak to you, uh, Mr. Muhammad Adil, um, a surgeon. He also, he was struck off, in fact. So these are very very draconian attitudes of censorship. You know, they say, follow the signs. If we can't discuss clinical problems with one another, if we can't raise the issue with the public, what are we here for? We're here to look after our patients. We are supposed to first do no harm. That has been broken. So we are silenced. A lot of the medical profession who know then speak out. The others who don't speak up, unfortunately, they are brainwashed. Absolute brainwashed following the uh, official dictate. We have um, Sunak Rishi agreeing to everything that the World Economic Forum says, because he's been a young leader with the World Economic Forum. A, a lot of the uh, politicians seen in senior positions have been young leaders in the World Economic Forum. We are, we are trapped. And there's only one way out. I don't uh, advocate violence. I don't advocate revolution. We have one thing in this country, and that is the ballot box. And that is why, even in retirement, and 20 years away from when I was first a candidate, 
of a party that's gone way beyond what it's supposed to do for the people. I've come back out and I want to stand. I want to stand in this constituency, the new constituency of Melton and Syston. We, we're not hoping to be government. We don't want to be government. I'm not a man for high office, but I want to make a point. I spend my whole working life caring for people. And I know how vulnerable people can be, especially the poorer people. They don't have a voice. The rich people can go somewhere else, find, find lawyers and so on, the poor people don't. We have to stand for all the people, not just poor people, we have to stand for everyone. The government has for too long taken our good nature for granted. 